Okay, so this is a test video. Um, I've had this idea to basically do tutorial videos just like the academic trainees would do. But this is basically from a student's perspective. Obviously, I don't know everything in detail. So this is just basically my explanation of how to do this question from a more simplified point of view. And also, I'm not going to go into so much detail. Basically, you're supposed to have already done this question yourself and read through it. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is summarize the key points in it as quickly as possible, just so that basically that the idea is that we're going to like I want to have lots of videos basically on on a many different questions so that instead of um, re revising all your theory and then trying to do a question without looking, what you could do as an alternative is just watch a short video that gives you the key concepts of how to do a question and then you can try it by yourself later on or whenever you really want to. But yeah, let's see how this works and any feedback would be great. Ideally, I, I need to get a microphone so that the, the sound quality is good. But I'm going to just try to use my earphones for now and hopefully it's okay. Okay. Okay, right, so let's start with this question. It's designers limited in valuations question pack one. Um, basically, they just an apparel company listed on the exchange. Okay, we don't need to know too much about that. Okay, so financial results and forecasts. When you see forecasts, um, it's probably it's a good indication that it's gonna you're gonna have to do a free cash evaluation. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say about that. Um, carrying on, we get a statement of comprehensive income. Okay, so now the income statement will be where all your incomes and expenses lie. So in this question, they gave us quite a detailed uh, breakdown of the trading expenses. Good. And basically what you need to do is for the statement of comprehensive income, you need to determine what are the cash flow effects arising from uh, the this, this statement of profit or loss. And also you need to determine what are the incomes and expenses relating to dissimilar assets, because those we're going to exclude. Basically, what we want to do with this uh, free cash flow evaluation is eliminate non-cash non -cash expenses and incomes, and also take out this incomes and expenses relating to dissimilar assets, so that we're left with basically our operational cash flows, which are basically operational meaning the cash flows that relate solely to the to the the main business process, the main way of uh, creating value, so excluding the dissimilar assets. So they'll give us the ones that I've highlighted in red are obviously non cash flow uh, expenses. Therefore, we must add those back. Um, other income and employment costs have a note. For other income, lease rental income does not form part of operating cash flows because that is a dissimilar asset. Included in employ employment costs, note two, is equity settled share based payments. These are also not cash flows. Therefore, you have to remove that from employment costs. It says it's already included in employment costs over here. So you want to remove that out of employment costs so that you're left with just the cash employment costs. Then they say SARS is not and will not allow any deductions. So we don't need to worry about cash tax implications for these. Okay. Interest received. Trade receivables is directly relating to your operations. So that would be included. But investment interest is relating to a dissimilar asset. Therefore, you need to remove that interest from uh, your operating cash flows. Okay, then the tax expense, normal tax will be a cash flow expense and deferred tax will be a non-cash 
tax expense. So those would have to be removed. Okay, so that was, so step one is statement of profit or loss, get your operating cash flows. So I've made a little note here on the side. Basically, step one, determine operating cash flows, remove non-cash and remove anything relating to dissimilar assets. Another thing to remember with that is that income, these dissimilar asset incomes and expenses also have tax implications and you need to um, adjust for those as well. Okay. So if we go to the memo, this is what they did. They took trading profit, which lies over here. And then what they did, so they took the trading profit and they just adjusted back for all of these. And they adjusted for all the non-cash and the ones relating to dissimilar assets, the incomes and expenses. So trading profits, you can see here, then adjusted for non-cash, non-cash, dissimilar, 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 non-cash, um, trade receivables, interest received. Let me have a look here. So this would basically just be interest received from trade receivables. These relates to operating, um, operating cash flows. And therefore, it'll affect the adjusted profit being the profit arising just from ca uh, operational cash flows. Then we get cash tax expense. Now remember, uh, our cash tax expense will be made up of our normal tax. No, and that's excluding the deferred tax. So it'll be the total tax to excluding deferred tax, basically just leaving with normal tax and adjusted for all the tax effects of these dissimilar assets. Okay. Then that'll give you your net cash flows, which you calculate from your statement of profit or loss. Now, another portion, now other cash flows that you're going to have to consider are the cash flows relating to the statement of financial position. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the notes here that I made, not those ones. We're gonna, so step one was determine operating cash flows and then that's from your statement of profit or loss, right? And now we're gonna to go to the SFP to calculate cash flows relating to assets and working capital. Remember, we only want cash flow effects coming from the SFP. Now, in the SFP, a mistake that I made uh, in the beginning was to basically just calculate the difference between these two and then add that in as a cash flow. But what you need to remember is that those closing, these balances are made up from the opening and there'll be additions and disposals. Those will be cash flow implications. But then remember, there's depreciation and amortization when you're going. Amortization, depreciation are included in this movement, and those are non-cash. So we've got to determine what are the additions and disposals relating to these um, these balances, and then we need to. And the way to do that is just to just get the difference between the two, and that'll be the movement. And then you, from the movement must exclude depreciation and amortization. So if you look here, how to calculate for PPE and intangibles, opening plus additions, minus disposals, and then you've got to remove this depreciation and amortization. And then the movement will, the, once you've done that, then the movement will be your cash flow implication. Then w for working capital, um, in this one, just a tip is just to use networking capital to make your life easier. And within networking capital, we need to remove the ca surplus cash. Surplus cash is uh, defined as a dissimilar asset, and therefore it will be added on at the end and not included in our, in our cash flow calculations. Okay, so now that we've done that, we now have... Okay, so we just done, we had, we just finished this. Now we have our free cash flows. Okay, now 
these are three cash flows that we calculated. And these are the ones that form part of T1 being the value of the forecast period, okay? So what we're gonna do is just put this in as cash flow one, put this in as cash flow two, and discount it back using cost of equity. And then we'll get a value for our forecast period being T1. Then they told us in the question that it was quite nice of them. They calculated it for us, or they just gave it to us. The free cash flow for the financial year ended 30 April 2015. So now our forecast period was 2013 and 2014, and now they're giving us free cash flow for 2015 of 1408. And then it is expected that the growth in sales would drop to a constant at 8% at the beginning of the year. Okay, so now this is our information for calculating T2. So when we go over here, T2 is calculated like this. So they essentially you got to remember your, it's like a dividend growth model calculation, except what you're using is free cash flow one being 2016's cash flow. So that'll be the 1408 multiplied by the growth, which is being 1.08. So that gives you your X16, X16 free cash flow. And then to get value at X15, you use X16's future free cash flow, and then you divide that by KE minus G. So basically it's the same thing as D0 equals D1 over KE minus G. Now you're getting free cash flow one over KE minus G to give you your value at X15. Okay, so that's step one is to get the value at X15. And then step two is to discount that T2 back to, to our valuation date. So basically being three years back. Okay, so then now that we've got our T1, we've got T2. Now we need to add on our dissimilar assets, okay? Surplus cash is given to you. Investments is given to you. You just use the balance. Um, for this, you just use the balance in the SFP at data valuation. Property, we all know how to do rental divided by rental yield equals value. Um, and then the forward exchange contract, they haven't considered this in the SFP, so we had to calculate the value of this ourselves. And remember for this derivative instrument, the value lies in the cash effect. The cash effect will be the difference between the forward rate on the date that the, the, forward, the contract will be executed or exercised, the difference between that rate and the rate that we're fixing it at. Okay, so that'll be basically the cash flow difference. And we're going to now PV that difference between those two rates to get a value of the derivative at valuation date. Okay, and the contract closes out on 30 June 20x12. Um, our valuation date is 30 April x12. So you basically just get the difference between the two at this date. And then you discount it back to valuation date, and that gives you your value. You add all of these up together, T1, T2, and the dissimilar assets, and then you get a value of your equity in total. Okay, I hope that has given you a quick explanation of how to do this question. Um, please give me any feedback on any tips or ideas of a better way to do this. Um, I'm just trying to think of ways to make um, studying this degree not so soul sucking because studying by yourself for hours on end is just it's just it's not nice so if you guys have any ideas on how to um, make this more exciting and make it more interactive and make it more social make it more um, practical um, please send me a message away thank you